This message comes from Capital One. Your business faces unique challenges and opportunities. That's why Capital One offers a comprehensive suite of financial services backed by the strength of a top 10 commercial bank. Visit CapitalOne.com slash commercial. Member FDIC. Hey, it's Brittany Luce. Real quick before the show. It's been a wild, exciting, exhausting election season. If you want to follow what's going on and make sure you don't miss a development, we want you to know that there are three things you can listen to every day. NPR's morning news podcast, Up First, is recorded before dawn and out by 7 a.m. Eastern Time each weekday. It's the morning podcast that captures the news overnight. Up First, 7 a.m. Later in the day, you can find a new episode of the NPR Politics Podcast with context and analysis on the big stories whenever they happen. So like you get an alert, big breaking news, you don't know what to think, look for the NPR Politics Podcast a few hours later. And finally, consider this as the podcast where NPR covers one big story in depth every weekday evening. They will be all over this election and its aftermath too. So, up first in the morning, consider this in the evening, an NPR politics podcast, anytime big stuff happens. An around-the-clock election news survival kit from NPR Podcasts. All right, thanks for listening. Here's the show. Hello, hello. I'm Brittany Luce, and you're listening to It's Been a Minute from NPR, a show about what's going on in culture and why it doesn't happen by accident. A warning, in this segment, we discuss films about cannibalism and also describe some sex scenes. Mm, You feel that? That chill in the air can only mean one thing. It's spooky season. And to close out our trilogy of terror, we're talking about the ultimate taboo, cannibalism. It feels like every decade has an it monster. In the 80s, it was slashers. In the early aughts, we went through an intense vampire phase. You better hold on tight, spider monkey. (laughs) But from where I'm sitting, I feel like horror is in its cannibal era. For a few years now, cannibalism has been everywhere in culture. You see it in The Last of Us, Society of the Snow, and of course, Yellow Jackets. So today, we've invited culture correspondent Netta Ulibi to break down this horror trope and explain what this taboo says about us, what we eat, and how we love. Netta, welcome to It's Been a Minute. Thank you so much. (laughs) My pleasure. I want to hear from you at the outset. How do you feel about the cannibalism trope? Like, are you into it in film or not? And why? I like horror movies. And this is uh, something that has been happening for as long as we have been people. It is kind of, it's the ultimate taboo. What could be more interesting than that? It shows up in Homer. It shows up in Shakespeare. It shows up as a vehicle for social satire. Jonathan Swift was writing about cannibalism. Voltaire and Candide. We can trace the way people have talked about cannibalism throughout culture up into this period today where we're thinking about cannibalism at this moment when the way we think about consumption and when women are telling stories in film and movies in a new way that they haven't before. Yeah. I mean, I have to admit, I was not really feeling cannibalism movies at first. Cannibalism films to me, they seem like they would be so one note, kind of like Hannibal Lecter. You know, Hannibal Lecter was the movie cannibal for a long time. In some ways he still is. But, you know, the terror of Hannibal is that he was this refined guy and he still chose to eat people. And, you know, personally, I didn't think there was much richness there (laughs) story-wise. But once I began watching the movies we're going to discuss today, I realized that recent cannibalism films had so much to offer in terms of cultural critique, exploring gender, misogyny, desire, like even historically, like men have almost always been associated with meat eating. But the movies we're going to discuss today, they're from women's perspectives, you know, whether they are the meat or whether they crave it. Right. Let's start with the movie that you and I both watched called Fresh. It's from 2022. Could you give us a quick summary of that film? Sure. So Fresh is about a toothsome young woman who's sick of being treated like (laughs) a piece of meat on the dating apps. 
So she goes to the grocery store, and there she's thrilled to meet a handsome doctor. Do you think I can have your number? We can meet here next week to talk about the broccoli. (laughs) Sounds good. Unfortunately for her, this perfect man drugs her. He takes her to his underground basement lair in his very gorgeous, brutalist mountain home, where she finds herself captive with a lot of other young women who are slowly dismembered. I'm going to sell you meat. I'm not going to kill you right away because the fresher the meat, the better. So, And their body parts are sold to rich men whose one percent gastro tastes can only be satisfied by eating young women. I'd love to hear more from you about how you see the cannibalism trope working in this movie. This is a movie that was made by a woman, written by a woman. It's very much from a woman's point of view. And I don't think that there's a single woman and probably a lot of men who haven't been on Mm. dating apps and felt, oh, my God, I am reduced to this commodified packaging. And I don't like Mm. how it feels. I am complicit in my own buying and selling of and I'm trying to make myself seem as appetizing as possible. And. This particular movie is very deeply much a critique of that, but it just should also say it's a very funny movie. Right. It really brought home the meat market that dating can often be. I thought it was a great way to explore how dating can sometimes feel, especially if you're a woman dating men, that you are what's on offer and you're not really getting anything out of it. I mean, one of the first scenes in the film, we see the main character going on a deeply, deeply unsatisfying date with a man. At the end of her meal, her date asks to take her leftovers. If it's cool, I'm just going to snag these leftovers and uh, I guess oh, I'll just oh, let oh, you yeah. leave a couple bucks less on the tip, if that makes sense. I mean, he is taking her energy, time, time, And also literal sustenance (laughs) that she paid for and consuming them in a way that, at least within the world of the film, does not feel all that different from, you know, again, the guy who's lopping off a piece of her body and butchering it to sell it to creepy guys around the country who have a taste for human flesh. I mean, I I think for a lot of women, dating can take pieces of you and, and feel really extractive. Okay, so here's my first spoiler alert for Fresh. The villain turns out to be married, and it appears in the film that the villain's wife had her leg or part of her leg eaten off, perhaps even before they got married, and she's still locked in. She's still with him and is on his side while he does all this horrible stuff. My friend Noah, I think you know her? She's missing. <sighs> no, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't. Um, do you, honey? No, of course not. Like, the film felt like it was remarking upon even the institution of marriage and how it might just be yet another version of constantly feeding another person who may not be feeding you in return. Right, or how women can sometimes be complicit in this culture as well. Mm. There are our victims reading beauty magazines, you know, as they're locked in their cells. And of course, it's all that's available to them. But how is it incumbent on all of us to break free from it? Hmm. I want to move on to a movie where the woman character has an insatiable desire to consume flesh. We're going to talk about a movie called Raw, which is a French film from 2016. So I can give the summary for this one Please. for listeners who haven't seen. It's about a French veterinary student named Justine. She's a freshman at veterinary school and she goes through this hazing ritual and she has to eat a raw rabbit kidney. She's a vegetarian, but she does it anyway. And suddenly she starts having these intense cravings for raw flesh. I mean, she wants to eat other people's, her own. I mean, she wants it all and does not care where the meat comes from. This desire, intense desire for flesh, human flesh, is paired with a strong, newly awakened sexual urge too. Netta, I want to hear from you on this. What did you see in this movie's cannibalism theme? Because I felt like there was a lot going on in this one. Yeah, you know, with this one, it's a very different take. And I think there's something, honestly, even a little bit more taboo about these this new um, wave of female cannibals that we're seeing explored. And part of it is this really horrific 
inverse of the story we've been told forever about female nurturing. For a woman to eat Mm. and to eat with like such gusto and with lack of boundaries and to give herself over to this all-consuming appetite, what is more culturally threatening than that? Cannibals are the new zombies, but in some ways they're also the new vampires and the new werewolves. We've seen a lot of those being the kind of characters that have enabled us to explore these stories of, you know, desires that might be forbidden, often queer desires, girls entering puberty. There was a whole spate of, like, girl werewolf movies for a while. To take that supernatural filter off and to go straight into a much more unspeakable, like, straight-up taboo, this is, like, truly unspeakable, is, I think, a real sign of women filmmakers hitting their stride artistically (laughs) Mm. and just ripping off these taboos. Yeah. I mean, women eating on film is taboo, like full stop. What or how women eat can attract commentary or shame in everyday life. So just seeing a young woman be physically hungry and to eat to try to satiate that hunger was exciting to watch in and of itself. That image almost was just as unusual to me as seeing her eat human flesh. Yeah, it will be interesting when we don't see very thin women playing these roles. Yes. When we come back, Netta and I talk about the aesthetics of cannibalism. Imagine two of the most beautiful young people (laughs) who have ever been placed on the planet and then make them cannibals. Stay with us. This message comes from BetterHelp. Can you think of a time when you didn't feel like you could be yourself, like you were hiding behind a mask? BetterHelp Online Therapy is convenient, flexible, and can help you learn to be your authentic self so you can take off the mask. Because masks should be for Halloween fun, not for your emotions. Visit BetterHelp.com NPR today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com NPR. Support for this podcast and the following message come from LinkedIn Sales Solution. Are you struggling to close deals? Cold outreach is wasting the time of both the buyer and seller at every stage. Your organization can overcome these challenges with LinkedIn Sales Navigator, the first deep sales platform. Right now, you can try LinkedIn Sales Navigator and get a 60-day free trial at linkedin.com slash minute. That is linkedin.com slash minute for a 60-day free trial. Let LinkedIn Sales Navigator help you sell like a superstar today. This message comes from Carvana. Whether you need weeks to research the perfect car or know exactly what you want, Carvana makes car buying easy. Choose from Carvana's massive inventory using customizable search tools. However you buy, buy your car with Carvana. We're back with culture critic Netta Ulubi, talking about cannibalism in horror and the underlying anxieties the trope reveals. Time for our last movie. It's a movie from 2022 called Bones and All. Netta. What's that one about? Imagine two of the most beautiful young people (laughs) who have ever been placed on the planet (laughs) and then make them cannibals. Right, right. Taylor Russell plays Marin and Timothy Chalamet plays Lee. I'm Marin. I'm Lee. I thought I was the only one. Right. Unlike Fresh, this is a, a story that takes place in an atmosphere of rural deprivation. These are young people who don't have a lot of money. They live out in the sticks. It's set in a sort of Reagan-era America. This is one where our two main characters, they have been born with what is suggested might be a genetic condition that makes them turn into cannibals with a lust for human flesh that gets more and more pronounced as they get older. We're dangerous to non-eaters, but we can hurt one another just as bad. What makes these two young people very different is they are obsessed with the moral consequences of eating meat. They're constantly asking, am I bad? I don't want to hurt anybody. I should feel something. So we murder people. We steal their stuff. We ruin lives that we don't even see. Come on, we're not even talking about it like this. We got to do this. We have to do it. 
They try to contain it. They try to control it. And then one of the undercurrents of this movie is that both of these young people are clearly seen to be queer in some ways, and their desires come out. They find themselves actually devouring people they are attracted to. But you know, they're also mm-hmm. they're also very attracted to each other, and it seems like that their mutual queerness might be something that erotically pulls them together as well. Yeah, that's such a good point. This was a film that, as you mentioned, like explored sort of like the moral quandary of how to go about eating people in a way that reminded me a lot of like vampire narratives. I think that also though speaks to something that makes this film different than like a movie like Fresh, right? Where eating women is like a choice. It's fun. It's conspicuous consumption. <laughs> exactly. But but this movie displays cannibalism in the opposite way. Like it's not like a cold choice one's making to, you know, maybe flash their status. It's like a physiological need that actually burdens and marginalizes the main characters. And, you know, they are living on the outskirts of society kind of as a result. It felt like in Bones and All, cannibalism was like a metaphor, maybe for generational trauma or mental illness. Each of the main characters, like, have thoughts about maybe how, you know, this cannibalism maybe was passed down to them, how it's something that they can't control, something that they have a lot of feelings about. And even, like, I think you got someone like Marin. She's, you know, this... Girl who, as soon as she turns 18, she's abandoned by her father. And she's like this young woman on her own struggling. And she's also dealing with other people preying on her, you know, again, looking at her and assuming she's like any other 18-year-old girl. It's like the only film of the three that we watched that dealt with sort of like the toll on the eater. Their consumption makes them feel things in a way that I thought was kind of an interesting way of commenting even upon like how we human (laughs) non-cannibals also consume. Sure. When I buy fast fashion or, you know, a pair of sneakers that was, you know, made by children, you know, how often do I ask myself, really, like, what is the human cost of my consumption? Whose lives are affected? And it's a question that I think more and more people are, are asking themselves, how can you live when consuming can be a deeply immoral act. And it's hard to avoid it not being Mm -hmm. a deeply immoral act. And I think that Mm -hmm. horror movies have always been a way for us to work out these kinds of questions and anxieties that that are underpinning our daily lives. Mm -hmm. What I also really loved about this movie that I thought made it so emotionally resonant was that while there was this larger social commentary braided throughout the story, there also was this core of this being a story for the real lovers. So this is a spoiler alert. But at the end of the movie, Lee, who's played by Timothy Chalamet, is about to die, like an almost Christ-like offering. Mm -hmm. Like Lee is offering up his body and his blood for his lover as this final loving act. Like he is sacrificing himself to sustain her. And the result of that narrative choice... It sounds like it could be totally disgusting, but it ends up being so much more romantic in the context and world of the film than I ever could have imagined. It was really moving. Yeah. So much of our language of romance and passion has to do with, it sounds cannibalistic. I'm hungry for you. I am ravenous for you. And there it just became a little literal. (laughs) A little literal, a little literal, very true. The films that we're talking about, you know, the cannibalism universe is much bigger than these three films. I mean, there's Yellow Jackets, Santa Clarita Diet, books like A Certain Hunger and Tender as the Flesh. Cannibalism is in the culture. Why now? Why do you think it has resonated so much recently with us? I was reading this quote from one of the creators of Yellow Jackets, who said that part of our revulsion to cannibalism is a fear of the ecstasy of it and Hmm. making the unthinkable the thinkable. Partly why I think Silence of the Lambs is such a transformative movie for cannibals is it was the first horror movie to win Best Picture. You know, it was a movie that brought horror into the mainstream in a way that hadn't been before. And, you know, culturally, since that movie has come out, there have been a couple of really huge changes that I think are worth thinking about as we consider this new crop of cannibal movies. The way we eat is completely different. When Silence of the Lambs came out, like, veganism was 
most definitely not mainstream. It was super duper weird. Like now, three fifths of American households go meatless every so often. Hmm. And every time I eat meat, the specter of industrial meat production is not that far from my mind. And we have to make a choice when we put meat in our mouths (laughs) to decide not to think about how it got there. And I can't help but think that this something about this underpins the anxieties that we're working out with these horror movies right now. Mm. Another thing is that we have more pets now than we've ever had before. Wait, really? See, I've never been a pet owner. 40 years ago, you would have been in the majority. Right now, you're in the minority. 66% of U.S. households own pets. And not only that, Brittany, more than half of pet owners think of their pets as a member of the family. (laughs) I have dogs now. They are members of the family. And I am sure that I am not the only pet owner that looks at my (laughs) sensitive, loving, intelligent dogs and thinks, how far are you from a sensitive, loving, intelligent pig? And, Mm. uh, you know, my relationship to animals has changed. And that, I think, has also changed my relationship to eating meat, even as meat consumption globally is rising. Totally. And and there's this anxiety around meat in all these movies. Like the villain from Fresh said he doesn't eat animals. Justine in Raw starts off as a vegetarian. Also, the writer of Bones and All is a vegan. But I hadn't really thought about how that might be connected to how many Americans may not be thinking of themselves as related to the animals that you know they live with, but also consume. You bring up a great point that meat of all kinds, even meat that is socially acceptable, there's still a lot of anxiety around meat in general. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Netta, thank you so much. This has been a real treat to talk about. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks again to Netta Ulibi. You can find more of her work at npr.org. This episode of It's Been a Minute was produced by Barton Girdwood, Alexis Williams, Liam McBain, Corey Antonio Rose. This episode was edited by Jessica Placzek. Our executive producer is Jasmine Romero. Our VP of programming is Yolanda Sanguini. All right, that's all for this episode of It's Been a Minute from NPR. I'm Brittany Luce. Talk soon. This message comes from NetSuite. What does the future hold for business? Can someone invent a crystal ball? Until then, over 38,000 businesses have future-proofed their business with NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud ERP, bringing accounting, financial management, inventory, and HR into one platform. With real-time insights and forecasting, you're able to peer into the future and seize new opportunities. Download the CFO's Guide to AI and Machine Learning for free at netsuite.com slash story. This message comes from PNC Private Bank, whose steady, calculated approach to wealth management might sound boring, but the outcomes are anything but. PNC Private Bank, brilliantly boring since 1865. PNC Bank, National Association, member FDIC. Want the latest news from the campaign trail and beyond? Well, listen to the NPR Politics Podcast Weekly Roundup. Every Friday, we tell you what happened and why it matters. Listen to the NPR Politics Podcast, wherever you listen.